You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio, available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com. Welcome to HowStreet.com Radio, the online source for market opinions. Here is Jim Goddard. My guest is market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. Welcome to the show, Bob. Yeah, Jim, good to be with you. So, the loonie is up, gold is up, copper is up. What's going on? Well, you just explained it. Uh, The Canadian dollar is tied to the course of the bigger commodities, and, uh, well, they've kind of been beat up lately, haven't they? (laughs) Yeah, the high, the cyclical high for commodities was back in uh, 2011, and we had our momentum peak forecaster come in on that one, and uh, it looked like we would get a long bear market for most commodities, and that also, at that time, gold and silver were very much of the hot play. So they've come down a long ways now. And uh, the ones that have stabilized nicely here uh, five or six weeks ago were the grains the, in, on the symbol of GY, GKX. And they've recovered nicely and got above one resistance line, having a little rest now. But I think there is hope for the grains to set or and continue an uptrend. but. I don't know of any very strong speculative moves uh, ahead in the future on that one. And then you've had the problem in crude oil, which is big time issues here. Um, The uh, price uh, became oversold a bit in July and then did a very weak bounce and then deteriorated. And then in uh, late August, uh, really started coming down. And, uh, no, sorry, that was late late September on that one, and it really started coming down. Now, this is interesting because you have a huge paradigm change going on in the energy business with fracking, in which uh, the liberal left hates because it marks economic progress. And so you've had a huge expansion of reserves in North America of oil and natural gas, and this is really changing things. and. Where it's important, and we've talked about this one before, is that Russia has been particularly ambitious lately. And uh, as a matter of fact, we read today that they're moving the tanks into Ukraine. Uh, worth reviewing the history on that one. Uh, in 1956, the Hungarian uprising was met with the Soviets set in tanks, and it was brutal. In 1968, there was the Prague Spring uprising in Czechoslovakia. And the Soviets sent in the tanks, and that was brutal and bloody. And then you get into the 80s, when Poland was the lead one on that one, and Gorbachev and oh, the dictator in Poland was named Jaroslawski or something like that. Um, they talked about sending in the tanks, but they lost their nerve and did not. So this is this one with, uh, with Putin sending in the tanks. Is, this really is neo-Soviet brutality. And you know, what's happening in Ukraine may make other nations very reluctant to give up their atomic weapons. The Ukrainians signed a peace treaty with Russia. The deal required that the Ukrainians give up their nukes, and the Russians promised not to invade. Now take a look what's happened. Authoritarians cannot stand uh, the concept of freedom within their country, and it bothers them to have a country on their borders that's free. But at any rate, he has to, Putin needs, foreign reserves, he needs hard dollars and all that sort of stuff, and he gets them from selling crude oil. So this goes back to, and we've talked this before too, we're back in the 80s when Reagan was trying to defeat the uh, evil empire, and its side deal worked out with the Saudis such that on a cyclical decline in the price of crude oil, they would not struggle and try to keep it from falling too much. And it went from, what, $35 down to 10 and then Russia, or we should say then the Soviets, were out of money and they could not fund their ambition. So here we are now. In Russia, the ruble has been declining severely, not as bad as in 1998 when it was part of the collapse of long-term capital management, but it's heading in that direction. This is putting their bond yields up. Um so, but at any rate, we may get a pause in this for a few weeks on the on the commodities. We'd been looking for a low for copper in November. Uh, maybe it might stabilize here. We'd been looking for a low in crude oil 
usually a seasonal low in December. Who knows when it's going to stabilize? And uh, as I said, we've already got the grains turning up. So uh, then on the stock market side, now this is this is really fascinating. We've we've gone through um, let's call it three quarters of a cycle. You've had in the summer months huge exuberance, measurable exuberance with uh, sentiment and momentum figures. Uh, the percent bulls got, uh, bears on the market got down to 13.3 percent. That's very low. Last seen in 1987. Then our proprietary model on the S and P gave upside exhaustion readings on the monthly in August and September. That hasn't been seen since the stock market peak in 2000. So we have had exuberance. Then on that part of that, you then end up having some divergence. The divergent was from the Russell 2000, the small caps, and then also from the European stock exchange rolling over. So, and then you get volatility, and we've had volatility. So, on our four uh, topic theme, the fourth item is uh, resolution. Now, how do you resolve all of those excesses in the market? Now, normally Mother Nature takes them all down, cleanses out the speculation, but you've got central bankers that are highly speculative. So, you've had uh, the Fed backing off of it, buying the bond market routine uh, that was scheduled for October. and But then you had the European Central Bank come in and say it was going to buy bonds. Uh, then you, what was also, that was positive. And then also positive uh, has been going into the election in the U.S. Uh, you could see the tidal wave coming, and it did indeed end up being a much bigger tidal wave than I thought it would be. That's a big plus for Oh, politics, the economy, individuals, uh, it's a major election. So that's a pl- been a plus for the stock market. And then you had the Bank of Japan do another one. They say we're going to depreciate the yen by 5% or something like that. And then you had Mario Draghi at the ECB come in just uh, yesterday and, and renewed his vows to do anything to keep the bubble going. So you've had a rush of very positive news items here that pushed this, some of the indexes up to new highs. And part of that was also pushing down the, the gold sector. So um, we think that credit spreads will continue to widen. They started widening earlier in the year, and they are not overbought on the move, and they'll continue to widen. You had the yield curve change in September, which anticipated uh, the setback in the markets, which turned out to be a correction. And uh, you've got that working again. So um, I think that a lot of good is in the market. Um, also, what's in the market is that you the, the seasonal. You can have seasonal low in October and then the seasonal high in May. Well, there's a whole lot of people did not get out. and uh, then those came in and bought on this thing. So I think a lot of the positives are in the stock market, and the stock market is vulnerable to changes going on in the credit markets, that's both in the yield curve and in credit spreads. We'll have more with Bob Hoy right after this. More and more people are looking to the Internet for intelligent, riveting, and thought-provoking interviews. To advertise on the Goddard Report and TalkDigitalNetwork.com, call 604-699-8600, 604-699-8600. Welcome back. We're speaking to Bob Hoy. He's the Chief Investment Strategist for Institutional Advisors. How long will the major quantitative easing introduced by Japan carry the market? And will this set up a situation where, again, the old saying, uh, sell in May, go away? <laughs> yeah. Well, I don't know that we have to wait to May for that one. But they have made unbelievable efforts. I mean, this their central bank behavior has become so reckless that if you go back even to when I came into the business in the 1960s, you know, this you just could not imagine that these guys would be so reckless. It, it's amazing. So now here you had the change in, in government, change in politics in the U.S. Um, Obama's still going to be as abusive as he has been of the political system. Uh, that That's a problem. So it's not all sunshine with the, uh, with the pickup of the majority by the Republicans. Also, they don't take office until January. So Obama can do a lot of uh, harm yet. Uh, we call in our province in British Columbia here that uh, previous 
socialist governments, uh, when they get elected out, as they go out, they have a scorched earth policy because they really don't like people who are not socialist, and they will try and do as much harm as possible. So we would expect this from to con- Obama to continue his harmful, uh, bullying ways. So that's not going to be a plus for the markets. But, you know, I think it's just, uh, we'll just see what happens here over the next few weeks. Uh, all of the good items, stories are in the market about central bank manipulations, uh, the U.S. election, um, Euro central bank, uh, the Japanese central bank, everything's there. Uh, so we'll just see how it plays out. Now, one of the interesting things is that, is that this gold sector has really been beat up and it's come down very hard and and various ways of looking at it become oversold. Whether you look at the stocks themselves, the Huey, or uh, what we often look at is the perfor- relative performance between gold stocks and gold itself because typically on a cycle, the mining companies will lead the moves in the metals. That That works in base metals as well. So what ideally... And you can never get ideal in the markets. But ideally, what we would like to see here is that the gold shares begin to outperform the bullion price. We've had a couple of days of this. Um, it may take uh, a week or so before one is really satisfied that the gold stocks are outperforming bullion. Uh, and then you'd look for the real support for the, for the, a, a good move. Now, backing this up is our favorite, the uh, the real price of gold uh, as deflated by uh, CPI or as we do it relative to commodities. And that thing is very important and uh, it uh, it goes down in a boom. So uh, the real price of gold has been declining since the boom really started to get hot in 2011. And it came down and set a big low in June. And we want to also go back to 2007, where the real price of gold had been going down. And in May of 2007, it started to turn up. And in May and June of 2007, the credit markets turned to negative and eventually went into a disaster. So here we are. And the real price of gold came down into June of this year. And uh, that's when the credit markets began to change to towards uh, adversity. Uh, nothing terribly dramatic yet, but it, the gun's loaded. So we've got a cyclical change to a rising real price of gold. So this is important to gold producers because if the, say, for example, if it's the old paradigm of looking at uh, a depreci- you know, declining gold, U.S. dollar in gold, um, in the, some of those times where you've got uh, the dollar really declining and gold going up, oftentimes the price of crude will be going up faster than the price of gold, and that represents energy costs. Oftentimes you can have wages, mining wages, going up faster than the price of gold. So uh, the simple business about the US, gold going up in U.S. dollars, making things good for the, oil, for the gold mining business, it doesn't work at all times. So what we do then is look at the real price, and it's had a very nice rise. It's been outperforming crude oil, which means that the miners eventually will have that blessing of their costs being held or de- their costs declining. So then you've, you've got the, the stocks to look at here now. So the real price of gold has taken the start of a cyclical bull market for gold. You've had a problem in the gold shares until recently, and they have come down to an oversold and are beginning to recover. And say a couple of weeks' time, you've got uh, an uptrend in gold shares, then you can look for, uh, well, although I've argued that it doesn't matter, but people follow it so widely and that you could have a, a modest rise in gold price in, in uh, U.S. dollar terms. But I'm going to emphasize, Jim, that, that if you're looking at buying gold shares by looking at what the dollar price of gold is doing what you're doing is speculating in currency fluctuations if you're looking at investing in gold shares based upon what their earnings are likely to be doing and those earnings are dependent upon the real price 
then you're acting as a heads-up savvy investor. So our advice is to kind of try to stop worrying about the dollar price of gold and uh, watch the realizing real price or as we cover it here. So the um, the next few weeks should see if we've got a bottom for the gold shares. And uh, if we've got that, then it's the start of a, a new bull market for the gold sector, which will be very refreshing. And as they used to say in the 1600s, a beam of light in a dark place hath exceeding refreshment. And there we are. Bob, thanks a lot for chatting with us. Always good to be with you, Jim. My guest has been market historian Bob Hoy. He's the chief investment strategist for Institutional Advisors. Their website, institutionaladvisors.com. You're listening to HowStreet.com Radio. Find us on Twitter at TalkDigitalNet. We're also up on YouTube, our channel, Talk Digital Network. You can forward comments about the show to info at HowStreet.com. I'm Jim Goddard. Comments made on HowStreet.com Radio are an expression of opinion only and should not be construed in any matter whatsoever as recommendations to buy or sell any financial instrument at any time. Available online at TalkDigitalNetwork.com, HowStreet.com Radio is a production of HowStreet Media Incorporated.